Hey everybody, it's Charles from HumbleMechanic.com and today is the day I answer your car related questions. Today I'm going to take your questions on going to tech school, getting better fuel economy, doing it by the book, and more. If you want a question on a show like this, be sure to email me, charles at HumbleMechanic.com, it's right down here. Put question for Charles in the subject, ask your question right at the top, then give me some space and give me the details of your question. That helps me out so much when I'm trying to answer your questions. Also, if you don't see your question on a show like this, be sure to check out the quick videos playlist on YouTube where I do one question per video. All right, let's talk about the sponsor of the day, which is CRP Automotive. CRP deals in a ton of OE maintenance and repair parts, timing belt kits, suspension components, and even fluids. In fact, they make the factory DSG fluid for Volkswagen and Audi. So check them out at crpautomotive.com. And before we get into it, if you want exclusive content, discounts to places like Eastwood, Eurowise, Black Forest Industries, MT Knives, Sonic Tools, and more, check out the crew membership program. There's a link down in the description. Mash that link, check it out, learn about all the amazing benefits. In addition to all that stuff you get, it does help support me, support the show, and the work that I do for you guys. And as you asked, I set up a Patreon account. The link is also down in the description if you wanna check that out. Now with all that taken care of, let's get into the questions. First one up is about better fuel economy. Are there any techniques to improve fuel economy on a 2017 Golf Sport Wagon 4 Motion, which did not harm the transmission or the vehicle? I'm looking to purchase a 4 Motion Sport Wagon here in Toronto and going from a small Mitsubishi Mirage fuel economy of 5 liters per 100 kilometers, which is about 45 miles per gallon, to the VW reported 9 to 10 liters per 100 kilometers. Is this something I'd like to remedy? Some thoughts include using good quality motor oil like Liquimali 540. Thanks for your episode on that, no problem. K&N air filter, uh, I, do, I actually answered the K&N air filter. I'll try and link that up. Hopefully Liquimali DSG, thanks for the episode. Fuels such as Shell V-Powered Nitro Plus and some techniques such as pulse and glide, speed up then coast when it's safe and trying to keep the car as close to 2000 RPM as possible within posted speed limit. If you have time to answer this question personally, I would appreciate it, your sage advice, or it's better to wait and prepare for the show. Uh, that's what I'm doing, I prepared for the show. Hope you and your family have a great summer. Thanks, man, I really appreciate that. So, on fuel economy, you, you hit not the lowest hanging fruit, but you hit the ones to the car. Good quality oil, good quality fuel, good quality lubricants. Um, let me add a handful of other things, and then at the end we'll talk about the biggest, most important factor when it comes to fuel economy. So we want to make sure that our tire pressures are also good, right? We want to make sure that we don't have any external wind resistance. Riding around with a roof rack, as cool as it might look, is going to plummet your fuel economy. I drove a sport wagon non 4 motion from the dealership down to Atlanta Motor Speedway, and I swear to you guys, I could watch the fuel gauge just drop, 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 drop. I must have stopped like a thousand and a half times to get fuel on that, uh, that down and back trip. So, you know, nothing up on the top. Again, tire pressure set correctly. Maybe even air up a PSI or two. That should probably help. Make sure if you don't have to, you're not driving around with a trunk loaded up full of wheel weights or whatever, you know, mulch, dirt. Don't have the car loaded up if you don't absolutely have to. That'll, that'll help fuel economy tremendously. It'll also help improve your brakes as well. Uh, you're buying a new car, otherwise I would say make sure your tires are in good repair. They also do make low rolling resistance tires, which may help improve your fuel economy. But there is one big thing, the biggest, the biggest factor in all of this for fuel economy, minus having a, a sail on the front of your car, is going to be your driving habits. Your right foot, or your right and left foot, if you are uh, buying a manual transmission car. So no race car starts, you know, ease on the throttle, ease up to your speed, keep your speed low. A friend of mine, Wayne, is a hypermiler, and, and I know a lot of you guys, like, that's not your thing. I get it. I have an incredibly heavy right foot, so I understand, and, I, and I'm with you there. But there are things that hypermilers do that we can adopt on our own, right? Um, for me, it's I don't speed very much, like two miles over the speed limit at five, seven at the most, I guess. And I always have the cruise control set. I pull my foot off and I just let the cruise control do its cruise control thing while paying attention to things like changes in incline, uh, going uphill, downhill, of course. You know, the Tiguan's really flaky with the cruise control where there's changes in elevation. So I don't usually use it on that, but my Passat is just perfect, perfect when it comes to it. So 
uh, the fuel economy is probably going to be less, even though it, the four motion system is primarily front wheel drive, unless it needs to be something other than you're still, you're adding weight, you're adding drag to, uh, to the, to the car. You can probably look, shop around for a tune, you know, Unitronics, a Canadian company too. I want to say that most people, once they get past the woohoo, I got a new tune on my car and I'm going to go, you know, full throttle everywhere they do tend to see an increase in fuel economy. So you may want to look at that as well. Uh, I don't know that bolting on any aftermarket parts is really going to help you. They serve other purposes, not so much fuel economy related, but um, your right foot and your driving habits are far and away the biggest factor when it comes to improving fuel economy in your vehicle. You know, there are times, a, a perfect example, we have our uh, 15 TIG one, right? When I drive it, I get low 20s miles per gallon because I, I have a right, heavy right foot. On the other hand, when my wife drives it, she gets probably in the upper 20s, 27, 28 range average because she doesn't drive as aggressive as I do. So the, the change in driving habits is the number one factor once you get the car straightened out. And again, because you're buying a new car, that shouldn't be as big of a factor as if I were trying to increase the miles per gallon on my Passat. Uh, or, which I'll never do, increase the miles per gallon on my GTI. That's a smiles per gallon car, not a miles per gallon car. So try those techniques. I'll try and link up in the description to Wayne's site. He does have some tips. I, I don't think that for most of us adopting all of the hypermiler tips to get insane, like 150 plus miles per gallon average or 80 plus miles per gallon average, I don't think for most of us that's the real world. Um, but I think if we can take and up by 5% our fuel economy. One, it's kind of a fun challenge. And two, it's putting money back in our pocket. Three, it is helping with the overall consumption that our vehicles and our, our vehicle lifestyle do require. So uh, that's something that's it's pretty important to me. I don't talk about it too much, but that is, that is an important factor too, I think. So great question, good luck. And hey, if you end up getting that sport wagon, throw a picture up on the Humble Mechanic uh, Facebook page because I would love to see it. Uh, side note though, you may want to consider an all track if that's of any interest at you, because from what I understand, they're having a tough time selling them. So you might be able to get a slamming deal all right, next one up from Franklin. Hey, Charles, I'm 17, about to be a senior, going to tech high school to learn some stuff and work as a general service tech at an independent place doing tires, oil changes, and inspections. I love working on cars, and I want to make it a career. I have an account for schooling with a large amount of money in it. Nice, so money for schooling is not what I'm worried about. I just want to know where to go next. I love working on Fords, and I love the Ford brand ever since I was a kid and I want to work at a Ford dealer, but I just don't know what I should do next. I know some, but not near enough, and I have started collecting tools over my time at the shop, and I pull all my own money from my checks and tools and gas, and I work. Open to close, nice, nice, nice. So it sounds like Franklin's got his, uh, his head screwed on straight, but what, what it boils down to is he, where does he go now, right? In tech school, uh, high school, um, learning tech, working at a shop. Dude, you're on the right path. Um, as far as where you go next, you know, there's a couple of options and, and there's kind of three that really stand out. First and foremost, you can step right into a Ford dealership once you graduate high school. I think that might be the key. Every dealer's different. A lot of places you do have to be 18 to work, so you may need to look into that. But I feel like you could probably step right into a dealership as an apprentice, as a, a service express tech, something, uh, let's not beat around the bush about it, at the bottom. You're still the new guy, even coming out of tech school, which we'll talk about in a second. You are the FNG, so you're going to be starting at the bottom and working your way up. And I don't think that's a bad thing at all. It's going to save you money on tech school, um, which you have budget for, which is kind of unique, but it should save you money there. Uh, you'll know what tools you need to buy, and you get a taste of working at the dealership before you spend $30,000 to go to tech school. You experience it and feel it because there's a lot of guys that and girls that go to tech school get a job at the dealership you know do great at tech school get a job at the dealership and it's not for them this job is not for everybody you know it takes a very unique special off their rocker a little bit individual to do this for a career and even if you can make it through tech school and do relatively well that doesn't mean you'll be successful at a dealership level remember that the dealership you're essentially working on a production line uh, not 
producing new things, but producing properly maintained cars. So it's air filter after air filter after air filter after oil change after tire rotation after tire rotation after air filter. Uh, you know, there's other jobs mixed in too, but it's a lot of maintenance work and, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. So you could take that route of stepping right in as an apprentice. Next, we move to the uh, community college. It's kind of going to depend on what's local for you. Some community colleges and are amazing, amazing places to go to tech school. They have not the volume of resource, but the same resources, lifts, scan tools, tools, as the bigger tech schools do. And it's, it's small. It's still college, right? So you can learn other things, not just how to work on cars. Um, and there's a lot of people that have had an incredible experience at a community college school like that and saved a ton of money on it too. So that's one other option. And finally, there's the, the big tech school, right? I'm gonna use UTI as an example for a couple of reasons. One, that's where I went, so I have personal experience there. Two, we've hired a lot of guys out of NTI, which is the one in Mooresville. Uh, same basic thing, it's just the NASCAR version. And three, probably most interesting, I think maybe for you, Franklin, is that they have a Ford program. So if you're dead set on Ford, Ford is where my heart is, UTI might really be the one you wanna consider. And you have a budget, so that's really cool. In your research, you're gonna find it's overpriced, you're gonna find it's a waste of money, you're gonna find you didn't, uh, the students didn't learn anything, you're gonna find students went there and passed and now work at um, AutoZone in the parts department or wherever. They're not doing what they set out to do on their first day of tech school. And here's the thing, that's fine, right? Think about all the people, right? Everybody's gotta to go to college, right? So think about all the people that go to college for marketing and are working retail. You could get that job without a marketing degree or are getting a business degree or have a business degree and work in a restaurant as a server. Not knocking either one of those things down, by the way. Um, plenty of people, probably more people in the global scope of post-secondary education go to traditional college and don't end up doing anything in their degree field than dudes and chicks going to tech school and not specifically wrenching on cars. They're still working in the automotive industry or they decide they hate it and get out either way. Um, but I would, take, I would take a heavy look at UTI. The guys that we've hired coming out of the Ford FACT program from a diagnostic skills level are definitely above the guys that just take the basic automotive program. It's not even close. I mean, the way their brain functions is much closer to a good diagnostic technician than the guys that just take automotive, basic automotive. Not knocking basic automotive, because that's what I did, uh, but the guys from Ford are coming out far ahead, you know, six, eight, 10 months ahead of the guys coming fresh out of school uh, on just the basic automotive program. So I would take a heavy look at that. It's probably gonna involve you moving for a year, year and a half. So what, not a big deal. Probably a good life experience. Get your butt a job while you're at, at the school if you go that route. Don't just be a, a party kid and get wasted every night. That's stupid, a stupid waste of your money. So man, I, I would explore those three. I would probably explore the going right to a Ford dealership first, especially because it's gonna be local for you, so it's easy. Then I would look at UTI, NTI with the Ford FACT program. Then probably community college. In that order, uh, if Ford is your goal. Now, if Ford is not your goal for the, the rest of you, you may wanna change that order up and obviously don't necessarily go to Ford if that's not where you wanna work, but the advice still applies. And, and I would put those three, th I would do all three, I would lay them all out, lay out the pros and cons, and then really figure out which is the best use of my time, my energy, my money to get me where I want to be. Paint yourself that roadmap. You're here, you know, that little star that says you are here, and you wanna be way over here, how do I get there? And that may run through a tech school, it may run through community college, it may be you just go right to an apprenticeship at a dealership and skip these two all together. But this is your goal, right? This is your goal. Paint yourself the roadmap to figure out how to get there, and then you're gonna have to work your eyeballs off. But uh, sounds like you're on the right track, and I think you'll be just fine. All right, next one comes from Jeff. Looked over your podcast, and I don't really see anything about this, or I suck at searching, <laughs> or I suck at labeling. Uh, being a prior, prior Air Force mechanic, I used to reference materials and by-the-book work mentality. While your videos and internet resource are awesome, 
I still like having the buy the book reference or the book itself. I saw VW's Irwin and noticed it's 1500 bucks for a year or 35 bucks for 24 hours. My question is, for someone like the DIYer, is Irwin worth it? When I get access, can I download all the reference material for later use, such as PDFs, respectfully, Jeff? So Jeff, great question. Irwin, guys, is the aftermarket VW Audi world, okay? So as a dealer technician, we had access to everything. Tech bulletins, recalls, repair manual, wiring diagrams, all that. It was not free. It was part of your dealership buy-in franchise. I'm sure they probably sent the dealership a bill every year for it too. Outside of the dealership, the way you access these things is called Irwin, E-R-W-I-N, and it is essentially the same thing. It's probably not exactly the same thing, but by and large, it is what the dealership does have access to. In fact, there are, at the corporate level, people that use that uh, instead of going through our, our pathway that we went through at the dealership. Jeff is totally right. It's 1500 bucks a year. I think there's a monthly and then there's a daily. So you can hop on, pay $35, and you have 24-hour access. And for the DIYer, I really don't think spending $1,500 a year is going to be worth it. Uh, you know, what is that, over $100 a month? Um, if, if you have two Volkswagens and you're working on them three times a year, not worth it. If you have three Volkswagens and working on them four times a day, okay, and you're working on your buddy's cars or you're beginning to uh, be a startup shop, 100% worth it. But for the guys that are just uh, like Jeff, DIYers, but still want torque specs and repair manual procedures and the by the book way, here's the secret. And I probably shouldn't even be telling you guys this on the video, but here's the secret. You pay the $35, you get all the information that you need and you're done. You have 24 hours, right? Pay your 25 bucks or 20 bucks or whatever it costs, 35 bucks, and get your information and then get it all within the day and then move on. And you know what? If three weeks from now, you're like, crap, I forgot to get this information. You pay $35 again, and then you roll on. It's not that much. If, let me put it this way. If you can't invest $35 and a couple of hours of your time into developing a repair manual of your own for your car, spend a hundred and something dollars and buy the Bentley manual if it's available. Uh, if you're not willing to do either one of those two things, I mean, think about how much your car costs. Is $35 worth the investment of having the knowledge, having all the information in, in order to fix it? Right there, yes. Now think about what it costs to bring it somewhere. $100 for check engine light diagnosis. Okay, worth it in a lot of cases in my opinion, but you're saving that money because you have access to the information. Or the vacuum pump video that I did that uh, should save you hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars, uh, no brainer, right? So I, I recommend not spending the 1500 bucks a year. Look at the one day option, build the repair manual that way. If you gotta buy two days, buy two days. If what you find in there is not what you're looking for, look and see if the Bentley manual is available for your car. In fact, even though I can get access to a lot of stuff uh, through, through the dealership, on my GTI, I'm probably gonna buy the Bentley manual because there's a couple of things that aren't in the factory repair manual, which I'm frustrated is not really the right word. Uh, there's a couple of expletives in front of that before, uh, before we get too uh, frustrated. But I, I am probably gonna buy that so that I have both. I have a book. If you're the book type, you have a book. If you're you know, on the computer type, you have it on a computer, whatever's best for you. But dude, pay the 35 bucks, get your information, build your own database, and then, uh, and then you'll have it all and you'll be good to go. And again, so what if you gotta pay for it again next month or the month after? Uh, it's not really that big of a deal. I don't think anyway, and I think that's a small drop in the bucket investment for a 20, 30, 40, 50, and up thousand dollar car. All right, wrapping up today is Dominic. It says help, in big letters help. I got a code P0089, and I'm gonna be honest, I'm 20 years old, live on my own, have my own apartment and car payment, and I need your help on what I don't know what to replace. I would love to keep this fairly inexpensive, but I know what I got to when I bought it. Any advice or anything would be great, thanks. It's a 2008 GTI 2.0, FSI stock. So the FSI is the keyword. This means we're looking at a early generation 2008. 2008 was a split year for a lot of cars. So uh, we're looking at the timing belt driven 
FSI two liter turbo engine. And the P0089 code is in fact a fuel pressure regulation code. I forget the exact verbiage, but it basically points to fuel pressure. So um, the FSI is notorious for fuel delivery problems. Anything from the in-tank pump, to the module, to the fuel filter, to the high pressure pump, to the camshaft, to the follower, to the thrust sensor, as they call it, on the high pressure fuel pump. Um, there are some that I've heard of cases of the fuel pressure sensor in the rail. I've never seen that definitively fix a problem, but I have seen a handful of them replaced. So here's the first thing that you need to do. You have the code. You need to try and see if you can get the parameters of it. If you can find a way to borrow VAGCOM or something and monitor high pressure fuel, that's step one, okay? You wanna look at it if you, if you can gain access to a scan tool that'll show you running high pressure fuel. Make sure your fuel pressure at idle is about 40 bar, and then under load, of course, goes up higher than that. If you don't have access to that, well, there's a couple of things that we can do. We can remove the high pressure fuel pump which should be fairly easy on your car. It's not the one with the hard line, it should have the rubber hose. And we're gonna pull that pump off and we're gonna look at the cam follower and we're probably gonna be able to do this and see a hole straight through it. I did a video on how this fails. I will link it up on, on whatever side the little white circle with the black outline and the, the black eye in the middle of it pops up. Click that link and check out that video and that will show you exactly what I'm talking about and exactly what to look for. I have also found that if you take the vacuum pump off, you can kind of see it most of the time if it's completely worn through or if it's severe damage to the camshaft, but I like to pull the pump off and look at it and make sure there's no damage on the pump or anything. If it is a problem with the high pressure fuel pump, before you make any repairs, you need to call your local dealership, give them your VIN, and ask them to look and see if you have any warranty extensions. There was a warranty extension on that car. I don't know if yours is gonna be covered. It may be too late in the generation to be covered, but it's worth a phone call because it's the difference between paying a bunch of money and getting it fixed for free. Uh, so make that phone call, please. If you pull your high pressure pump and the pump looks good and the follower's not worn at all uh, and the camshaft looks fine, I would put a new follower in it because, well, it's pretty much a maintenance part. I would clear the fault and then I would see what I have. You need to see which of these pieces of the puzzle are not functioning properly. And unfortunately for you, without a scan tool or without like a fuel pressure gauge, it's gonna be pretty challenging. So try and find someone local, hop on Vortex or hop on you know, one of the local Facebook groups. There's so many VW Facebook groups, it's insane. Hop on one of those and see if anyone local has VADCOM and can help you out because you can go in with VADCOM and look at your fuel pressures and really start to not point to the problem, but point to the area that has the problem and then we can go from there. So my guess is, I'm gonna guess, 100% guess, of course, without seeing it, you're gonna pull that high pressure pump off and it's gonna be worn enough to trip that light and uh, you're probably going to need a cam, a high pressure pump, a follower, and on and on. Hopefully it's not that bad, but you know I've, I've seen some that are pretty bad. This is probably a good opportunity to also look at doing a timing belt. You're knocking on the door of 10 years old. I think that belt was 130,000 miles, 120, 130,000 uh, miles that it was uh, replaced at. I would do it now. If you need a camshaft, just do it now, overlap it. It doesn't make any of the jobs any easier, but uh, it'll save you a little bit of time, I think, a tiny bit of time on doing them together. If you're paying someone to do it, According to the labor book, it does overlap, so it'll save you money that way. But if you're DIY, there's ways to do both of them independently from each other. Uh, the only thing it really does make easier is the, the cam girdle coming off. It makes it a little bit easier. So uh, I'm going to guess, man, that's probably what you got. Check that video out that I did on what to look for. It'll show you exactly what you need to look for on that camshaft, on the high-pressure pump, what a failed one does look like. Uh, if, if it doesn't look bad, look a little closer. If it still looks okay, look even closer because you'll probably find a little bit of damage on the camshaft if that's the problem. Uh, but again, without knowing fuel pressure, without being able to monitor what's going on, without being able to hook up a manual fuel pressure gauge, it's going to be a bit challenging to figure out. Hopefully, for the sake of diagnosis, pulling the pump off, uh, the pump off shows you what's going on. But unfortunately for you, that's going to be the expensive one. So 
I'll, I'll hope that that's not what it is. But man, good luck, and I hope, <laughs> I really do hope that it's not that big of a deal. All right, guys, I'm gonna wrap it up there. Questions, comments, you know what to do if you like this video, give it a thumbs up. Hey, also, if you like the video, throw a share on it too. Share it around if you're in any VW-related communities or uh, technician-related communities. I really do appreciate that. Again, if you want exclusive content discounts, you can't get anywhere else as well as VW Audi training manuals, check out the crew membership program. It's an awesome way to get a return on your investment of money and help support the show, help support the work that I do for you guys. Another couple of ways to do that is check out the Patreon as well as use my Amazon link, all the links down in the description if you wanna check that out. You can also follow me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and of course, Snapchat. All right guys, hey, thanks so much for watching. I love you and I'll see you next time.